Okay, hello and welcome to the Ossington Circle. I'm here today with Paul Maloney, the author of The Therapy Industry, The Irresistible Rise of the Talking Cure and Why It Doesn't Work. Is that right? Yeah. So Paul, That's right. thank you for joining us today. Uh, can you, can, why don't we start with uh, just, why don't you tell me a little bit about the argument of the therapy industry? Okay. Uh, well, just in the basic argument is that psychological therapy, talking treatments and talking treatment techniques have become very widespread throughout Western culture and throughout much of the world as well. And th this, this diffusion of talking therapy and talking treatments is often assumed to be a sign of increasing, I guess, humanism, the provision of care and aid to people who are distressed. It's often seen as a very helpful and sensible thing to do. And the argument of the book is that, in fact, the vast majority of talking therapies uh, are not nearly as effective as they are claimed to be, but they have little basis in, in science, in fact, uh, and that they are not as helpful as people often assume them to be, and that they um, actually make it harder for people to understand why they're distressed, because most psychological therapies are premised on the idea that distress arises from a failure of our insight, motivation or learning, our failure to strategize or to adjust to the world around us. And they encourage people to think that the source of their problems comes from within, from these internal failures, when in fact there's a vast amount of evidence which has been accumulating steadily for the last century, one could argue, and particularly in the last 20 or 30 years, which suggests that it's the social environment that brings about the problems that bring the, 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 the problems that people go to seek treatment for are caused by their social context, things like poverty, inequality, racism, sexism, harassment, mistreatment at work, uh, general life pressures, debt, yeah. financial insecurity. Those are the kind of things that create the problems that take people to therapists. One of, the, one of the striking things that you do in the book is you review a lot of the scientific evidence, these meta-analyses yes. uh, about therapy. And, uh, you know, one, one quick response that I think might arise is people might say, well, you know, therapy is unscientific, but drugs, obviously, like antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications, yes. they, those have scientific backing because they address chemical imbalances in the brain. Yes. What's your uh, understanding of that particular argument well, or idea? Uh, I, I think there's, there's, uh, there's a, a parallel between the evidence base for many psychiatric drugs and what we find for talking therapies. It's not an exact parallel, but it's fairly close. So, for instance, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of a British psychiatrist named David Healy, who's... Yeah, he uh, came to Toronto, so Toronto people know a little bit they about it. Yes, I would think they would, yes, well, as, as, you, as you probably know. David Healy uh, spent the last 25 years or so uh, looking into the evidence base in support of many leading psychiatric drugs, including the SSRI antidepressants like Prozac, uh, and also... Uh, drugs that are used to treat uh, people who have symptoms that we might describe as psychosis or schizophrenia in inverted commas. And what he has found is that this evidence base is in fact much more tenuous when you inspect it closely than you might suppose. Um, one of the key problems with this is that the, the, the research from drug company trials is kept under lock and key, the basic data that informs the research rather so that uh, it's not available for public scrutiny. And then you've got the fact that this data is often cherry-picked by the drug companies, and then it's massaged through various statistical procedures, and then it's packaged uh, often by ghostwriters who are paid to make that drug, the, the, the latest version of the drug, which is re released onto the market, to look as effective as possible in relation to its predecessors and competitors. And what you have there then is that uh, the, these ghostwriters, I think they account for, for perhaps up to 50% of academic papers, which is quite astonishing. Wow. Yeah? Stunning. So, so there's yeah. clearly a very strong set of biases built into the whole field. And then the drug companies market uh, these drugs on the basis of this faulty data. And doctors, clinicians working in general practice, for instance, are not really well trained to sift through uh, the, the research trials and the reports of the research and they're often unduly swayed by drug company literature. 
So that so I think it's actually a close to, parallel. But when it comes to the talk therapies, I mean, so on the drug side, you have a billions of dollars yes. industry. Yeah. Uh, on the therapy side, not maybe not so much. So what is the what is the therapy industry pushing people? Like, what's the material or other interests in, in, in moving people towards talk therapy? I think that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, and again, th th there are some parallels because um, I think, okay. you know, if you take Brave New World, for instance, and the, the novel Brave New World and the use of sound, you, you can yeah. see that there's a, a, a biochemical therapy there which is used to pacify the population right. and sort of keep them pliable. Um, and I think you can argue that the same thing happens with psychological therapies in some ways. Uh, the, yeah. this, this whole emphasis on internal processes and change coming yeah. about through tr internal transformation um, is certainly convenient for governments who don't want to ask too many difficult questions about why so many of us feel lousy and are struggling um, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's often convenient for employers as well and other institutions where, where there's a tendency not to want to ask hard questions about why people are distressed. I think also it's to do with possibly the Judeo-Christian roots of our society, which has a strong emphasis on the religious confessional and on change right. through right. Uh, personal scrutiny and work upon the self to make us into something better. So it certainly chimes with that cultural heritage, which is very strong. And perhaps another element, uh, which the, uh, the, the, the therapy critic William Epstein talks about, uh, is, is the idea that, uh, that, that, that consumer capitalism uh, is, is in, in many ways depends on this idea that we can overcome our situation no matter how bad things are. We can overcome, we can become the president, we can rise above, we can rise and, and, and from our lowly station into the professions, uh, debt, whatever problems the world throws at us, we can overcome them. And of course, psychological therapy in essence is premised on, on that idea that with the help of a right. therapist, you can discover reserves of strength that will enable you to overcome whatever the world throws at you. And that has an obvious value. Uh, for certain people, anyway, in the kind of society in which we live, you you've t you also talk about different. Uh, I mean, schools of thought would be one way of of, of putting it, or fads <laughs> might be another way of putting it. But you know, whether it's yeah. Freudian uh, psychoanalysis or cognitive behavioral uh, therapy, or uh, you know, around here, you know, at my university, I see signs for mindfulness-based therapy, which I find, uh, which I haven't hadn't seen until relatively recently. So, yeah. Are, are all of these just like different packages for the same basic premise, which is you sit in a room with somebody and talk and then you get better? Uh, I, th I, think, I think one could argue that, yes. I, I, yeah. I think they, they, the different therapies make different assumptions about where the mechanisms are uh, in, uh, and what, what the nature of those mechanisms might be. But they share this common attribute that the mechanisms are essentially internal. So. Yeah. Uh, in, in cognitive behaviour therapy, for instance, the, the, the vast majority of CBT practitioners will focus on helping people to change their negative thought patterns. They will help them to uh, adjust their behavioural repertoire so that they are behaving and doing things in a more positive way that will supposedly enable to get, them, get the things in life that they need. Um, if you look at mindfulness, again, that's very much, uh, obviously, it, it comes from, it's got a strong root in Buddhism, of course. Uh, and it's also based on the, the idea that we can scrutinize the, ourselves, that the mind is a kind of Cartesian theater, if you like, uh, so, so that we can actually look in on our thought processes and detach ourselves from them, and sort of sit back, as it were and no longer be disturbed by this troubling content that's bubbling away. So again, it's very much an internal thing. And that's, that's not to say that these things are totally wrong. Obviously, we can modify our thinking to a degree. And we, can, we do have the capacity to observe, to, to agree what's going on. But the, the, the difficulty comes along in the assumption that that's enough to shift people when they are very distressed. So it might be all right if someone has a very mild degree of distress but once you start to get into significant levels of emotional pain and disturbance those things become very problematic I think.
And, and this is a good entry. We've been talking a lot about the internal bias, maybe, yeah. of these therapies. Yeah. Uh, tell me about social materialist psychology, which is what you introduced towards the end of the book. Yeah. What is social materialist psychology? Okay. Well, the the, the term social materialist psychology uh, was it was invented by a, a British clinical psychologist called David Smale, and uh, David Smale is quite an interesting person. Uh, to, to look at if, if you're trying to study how the ideas of some psychologists anyway can be influenced by their clinical experience and uh, Smale was one of the first clinical psychologists in the UK to operate in the community so up until the 1960s uh, clinical psychologists had generally been based in psychiatric hospitals working with highly institutionalized disturbed patients and often as handmaidens, if you like, to psychiatry, so performing the um, psychometric tests for psychiatrists and helping with behavioral therapies. And uh, that in the 60s, they actually started to move out of the hospital to work uh, with general practitioners and in the community. And uh, Smale was one of the first people to do that in Nottingham, and he spent 30 years as the head of the clinical psychology service in Nottingham in, in northern England. And... Uh, what Smale found, because uh, he wrote quite extensively throughout this period, and he's still writing, in fact, um, what Smale noticed was that, uh, to begin with, he was seeing some of the most deprived people. So it's generally working class people were his main constituency, uh, often working class women as the most oppressed or deprived people. Uh, then he noticed that in the 1980s, with the rise of Thatcherism in the UK, and the first introduction, really, of sort of neoliberal policies that now dominate our lives and that are part of, indeed, of the austerity program that governments are imposing on us. When, when those neoliberalist policies started to come into the UK, Smale noticed that suddenly through his door he was starting to get a lot of middle-class professionals. So he was starting to get university lecturers, um, teachers, um, accountants... Uh, people in those sort of professional fields. And what, what he observed was that all of them attributed their anxiety or their depression to their own failures, their failures to strategize properly in the world of work, to adjust to the, the demands of the modern world, their lack of motivation. Whereas to him as a psychologist with an interest in society, it struck him as pretty obvious that they were actually experiencing uh, a disintegration of their world. So they were often in workplaces where accepted ways of working, ethical practices, ethical values, tacit values in many ways, informal values, were being undermined and shoved aside in favour of a competitive, hard-nosed world of business, uh, no-nonsense profit-making and those kind of things. And many of them were being asked to make decisions which affected other people. Uh, which were quite brutal uh, from their perspective. And to Smale, it was pretty obvious that that was where their anxiety was coming from, uh, even though they couldn't see that very easily always, straight away. Um, so that was, it was that, I think, that really got him thinking about this idea of society bringing about the problems that bring people to clinicians like Smale. And social materialist psychology is a reflection of that. What struck Smale as well over many years of practice was that he kept seeing the same people coming back after therapy. If you're based in one area in a community um, and you're not moving on from job to job, what you notice is you tend to see the same people coming back again and again. This is quite a common thing. And this struck Smale as quite a significant observation that's not often written about. And, of course, the reason was that these people were not being cured by therapy. They felt better unburdening themselves to, to a thoughtful, intelligent listener, a sympathetic listener. So you feel better, sort of bright-eyed, you feel somewhat refreshed by that. But when you go out back into the world, it continues to do its damage, and these people will be coming back. And that was the other insight that led him to start questioning the basis of talking treatment. So the idea of social material psychology comes from that, and it also comes from, uh, I guess, the critical mental health literature, which is informed by epidemiology. As you, as you probably know, Justin, there's been a lot of research over the last 20, 30 years, which shows that things like poverty, indebtedness, pressures at work have an enormous effect on people's mental health and are very harmful 
and have a direct bearing on things like suicide rates, for instance, as well as things like clinical depression. So it was that kind of literature that influenced him as well, as, a knowledge, as well as a knowledge of the sociological literature, um, you know, academics who looked at the effects of the social system on people's state of mind and how they function as, as individuals. So it was that sort of critical literature as well, which informs, uh, informs social materialist psychology. And the idea behind it is that people are influenced massively by their environment. It's the world that, that has the biggest influence. And people are moved by power. So the key, the key factors in it really are power, coercive, economic, ideological power and embodied power. And people are often manipulated by interest. So governments make appeals to their interest in order to get them to do the things that they want them to do, or, or corporations do that. So, so how those... Do you, yeah. So how Sorry. do you treat someone? How, how, how is the treatment different then? How, what are the prescriptions that come up well, from this the, school the, of The thought? thing about social materialist psychology it, is that uh, it, it suggests that, that psychological treatment is very limited. Right. What you can do, uh, you can help a person to clarify why they're distressed. Because there's a vast ideological apparatus in society which discourages us from, from seeing where our distress usually comes from, the ultimate roots of our distress, people tend to blame themselves. And arguably, a lot of psychological therapies encourage them to do that. They tend to see their mental health problems as a result of their failure to struggle or to be sufficiently determined. In essence, just a lack of willpower. So one of the things that social materialist psychology can do is to dispel some of those illusions and to help the person to see that their problems actually come from outside on the one hand and also from their history as well, their, their history as, as a human being living in the world, which can't be erased. Again, many therapies seem to promote the idea that you can erase your past as you would clear a, a disk on a computer. And of course... That's, that's inaccurate. That's not how we function as biological creatures. So this form of psychology does enable people to see uh, that their predicament is not their fault. It does help to remove that sense of blame. And that's useful. And to help them to understand where the true sources of their troubles are likely to lie, um, that can be helpful. Um, it can also encourage them to acquire power and resources in the outside world. But of course the catch is where that's possible right. and that's the difficulty because for so many people it's not, if it were possible they wouldn't be seeing a therapist. Right. And, and of course to see that. in a way the, the, the prescription is a collective organization to try to change the, the equation of power in society, right? But that also yeah. is a tall order. Uh, that leads me to my last question though, like, you know, I, I do think some of our viewers, some of the people that will be watching this video are activists or people who try to do that kind of thing, try to change the world. Uh, and if you, yeah. if you take that on, you know, your friends and family tell you you're crazy, the institutions are against <laughs> you, you, your job might be threatened, you have to, you know, be, be very careful, there's this constant sense of tension, uh, you're engaging yeah. with a world that's depressing and anxiety inducing. What kinds of uh, prescriptions can you offer as a psychologist for activist specific burnout and depression and anxiety? Right, for, for, for those kind of things. Well, I think uh, one of the things that's, that's, a very, that's a very big question, yeah. but I think one of the things that's very helpful with that is solidarity. So if you think about power, mm -hmm. what you're trying to do, if you're trying to challenge iniquitous power structures, that's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. It's a very depleting and exhausting thing to do quite often. So one of the things that can help with that is solidarity with other people who share your values in common and can provide support. And if you think about it, solidarity is one of the few forms of power that's available to ordinary people. Right. So that is one of the main things probably is to seek links with other people who are supportive. Um, I think uh, aside from that, the other thing would be to try to acquire power for oneself yeah. in the way that we all do through, you know, through, for instance, work, yeah. uh, social connections, um, in, uh, training, academic training, trying to build as many resources into your life as possible right. uh, so that you can call on those resources if you need them.
That makes a lot Which of sense. again, I think that's probably a very commonsensical sort of answer. But that's but, not uh, necessarily what the what the therapy industry would tell you to do, right? They would tell you no, to no, adjust to no, your no, situation. That's, yes, that's right. But I mean, the, 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 there are certain things that, that you might think as therapeutic in a, in a narrow sense that are helpful. Like, for instance, you know, taking exercise, your diet, yeah. um, sports, relaxation. But again, in order to do those things, you need resources exactly. to be able to do them. You need to have the transport to go to these places yeah. and money, perhaps, to access them. Yeah. You know, for instance, a, a, a leisure club or whatever. You know, if, if you think about the evidence for exercise in poorer people, a lot of poorer people don't take up recommended exercise programs because there's nowhere amenable or safe or convenient to exercise, which middle class professionals and above often take for granted. Uh, you know, it's easier to go to the private health club where you're treated very nicely than it is to go down to your wind-blown community centre covered in graffiti and have to worry about being mugged yeah. on the way, yeah. you know, to take an extreme example. Absolutely. So those kind of things do count. So I think if you, do, if you do have the resources and the connections in your life, then yes, it makes sense to take advantage of whatever forms of um, beneficial activities there are that you can get involved in that are good for your health. Thank yeah. you very that, much. That, yeah, one, one resource that uh, you should access and that's good for your health is Paul Maloney's uh, The Therapy <laughs> Industry. Uh, make sure you access that resource as, as much as you can. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Okay, thank you, Justin. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll